Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're doing a continuation of a teaching on community and this will be part number two of this of this series and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a series I'm very very excited about um, because we're, I'm, we're going through the Old Testament into the New Testament and we're seeing how God viewed community in the Old Testament and how does he view it in the New Testament. What should we expect as believers uh, as far as God being with us? Because we know that if God is with us and we know that God wants, if we know that God wants to be amongst us, especially as a community of believers, as we gather together, we must make room for God. We must allow him to do what he wants to do. Therefore, when we get together, it's not just man getting together. It's not us trying to control the meeting just because, because it's our meeting. But when we understand that, that the Holy Spirit wants to be in the midst of us, that changes the parameters of the whole thing. And so this is why I'm doing this, this series of teachings. Um, we've been looking at the Old Testament so far. And we know from the Old Testament that the prophets and the kings and so on uh, talked about gates being opened and, and the salvation being walls and so on. What does that have to do with us today? That's one question I want to answer. The second one I want to answer is how is community expressed in the Old Covenant? So I'm going to be jumping back and forth between the Old and New Covenants so that we can understand God from both perspectives, and we can see how God is building on this whole subject and what his intention is. Then I want us, if we have time, I want us to look into our future as far as this community. What is that, what does our future look like with God in our midst? Does God want to be in our midst? If he does, you know, so we're going to have to look at the book of Revelation about that. All right, now, up to this point, we've been trending through a lot of the old a lot of the old covenant, and I, the last time I talked, I talked about the Isaiah, I think it was, and some prophets in the old covenant foretelling of something that was going to take place in the future, and um, we talked about how um, the father the father is reaching out to mankind with mankind responding some of the time in a good way and sometimes not responding. Sometimes when God would reach out in the Old Covenant, the, the, um, the kings, the prophets would respond and the priests would respond in a good way and sometimes they'd respond in a very negative fashion like they didn't even know God was in the midst of them. So now today, I, I want to trend from that, the Old Covenant, in more into the New Covenant right now. I want to I look at, I want to look at the the new covenant as far as us as individuals what does the bible say in the new covenant about us and us communing with god as individuals then later on i'll get into that as as a community um so we know that god took the most extreme measure sent his son to die on a cross for us so that we could have abundant life so that we could be redeemed back. We know there was a, there was a big cost involved. He gave, the father gave his son on our behalf for what reason? So that we could, so he could get us back. Now I want to read to you out of Luke one, or excuse me, Luke three, 21 through 22. This is a very uh, pivotal scripture here, very important scripture. One day Jesus came to be baptized along with all the others. As he was consumed with the spirit of prayer, the heavenly realm ripped open above him, and the Holy Spirit descended from heaven in the visible, tangible form of dove and landed on him. Then God's audible voice was heard saying, My son, you are my beloved one, though through you I am fulfilled. Now this had to be a dramatic scene. Just picture yourself there, Jesus coming up to get water baptized, and all of a sudden, there is a voice that comes out of heaven. And I know when I, re I read through that, some of the respect, if you read through these verses further, and I, di I didn't write them all, I didn't uh, type them all down, 
but you find that some of the people didn't understand what he was saying. Some people thought it was thundering. Some people thought it was an angel speaking and so on. But the scripture is very clear that it was the father speaking to his son and saying that he was well pleased with him. Now, this had to be a very dramatic scene because this is the first time this had happened. This is the first time that heaven was torn open and it was torn open above Jesus. And out through this opening in heaven came a dove, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming down and resting on Jesus. Uh, after he came up out of the water, being water baptized, the Spirit came down and rested upon him. So we need to remember that the heavens were torn open. What is that speaking of? Could this be what Jesus was talking about? He says, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. Was it through what had just happened here with the heavens being torn open? Is that what he was getting at when he said, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven? Because was he, was he meaning by that is that what is in heaven needs to be brought down on earth. And so that, that's, that's a big question. I, I personally think that's exactly what he meant that that uh that was one of jesus prayers and how do we bring heaven down to earth because we know that in heaven everything is perfect there's no sin in heaven there's no corruption there's no there's no part of the fall that that heaven was torn open so the the heavens the heavens were torn open so that which is in heaven could be accessed and be brought down here on earth now i want to read two sets of scriptures one is in Ephesians, the other is in Colossians. They're very, again, they're very pivotal scriptures because it begins to explain uh, what is been made available to us. And, and so when Jesus was baptized and the heavens were torn open, it was like he was saying to us, hey, I'm sending you guys an invitation. I want you to come up here where, where, where the presence of God is in the heavenlies and I want you to come up because now I've given you access, I want you to come up here because there's reasons for you to come up here. I, so, so Ephesians and Colossians are some scriptures that are very precise on this and explain why some of the benefits of coming up to the heavenly realm. Now, I want to stress here that we right now have access to the heavenly realm. Many people think that they'll go to heaven when they die and that if they're, if they're Christian, they will. But we actually have been given access to heaven to go to heaven now before we die. And there's reasons for that. I touched up on that already some, and I referred to, I think it was in Hebrews 4, about we go to the heavenly, the throne room of God, which is a heavenly place, to receive grace and help in our time of need. So this here is going to explain just a little more of what I'm talking about. This is in Ephesians 2, verses 6 through 7. He said, he raised us up with Christ, the exalted one, and we ascended with him in the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. For we are now co-seated as one with Christ. Throughout the coming ages will be the visible display of infinite, limitless riches of grace and kindness, which was showered upon us in Jesus Christ. So this is, this is actually saying that when a person belongs to Jesus, they, they, you are actually put in Christ. Now, I know I haven't talked about that, and I, I don't want to get into all that. That's a whole other lesson. But, but we, when we get born again, we're actually placed in Christ. So all the benefits that, that Jesus achieved for us are in Christ. And because we are in Christ, we have access to all these benefits. So what this scripture is saying here is, we actually, when we get born again, we actually can ascend into the heavenly places and we can participate in this glorious perfection that's taking place. And we, because we've been co-seated with Christ, because we're in Christ, we have access, we can go to this place. And, and there's going to be changes take, when we do this, there'll be changes taking place in us that have to do with the time to come in the future. And so we have a lot, we have a, it's very important for us to access this place so that changes can take place in us so that we can be more impactful in, in our outreach to people here on the earth. And then the other one is in Colossians chapter three, one through four. It says, Christ, Christ's resurrection is our resurrection too. So remember with, when Christ was resurrected, we participate in that resurrection. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above. 
For that's where Christ sits enthroned on the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realms and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Your crucifixion with Christ is sever has severed the tie to this life and now your true life is hidden away in God in Christ. Now this again, like in Ephesians, is a very, very interesting set of verses and that is we, we have the capability of participating in the resurrection of Christ. Now, what does that mean exactly? That means that we, again, have access to the heavenly, play, the heavenly realms. And it says here, there's another word it brings up for the first time, it says we should yearn for this. Now, it's not enough to know this only. It's not enough for me to say to you, you have access to heaven because you're in Christ. If you understand that, but you don't yearn for that, you have the privilege of it, but you never, you never taste the privilege. You don't experience, you don't encounter the, the privileges of what this scripture, these verses are talking about. So it says, yearn for this. In other words, this is something as believers, we, we have to hunger for. We have to long to be in the presence of God. We've been given the invitation to be in his presence. Now we have to long for it. We got to say, Father, I want to be in your presence. Jesus, I want to be with you in the heavenly realms. Like I said, because when we, when we participate in the heavenly realms, things happen to us on the inside because we're spending time with our Father. This, what I'm talking about, is no different than Jesus when he was here on earth. And many times as you're reading in the Gospels about Jesus, Many times he would walk away from his disciples. He'd go up to a mountain. He'd go out. He'd get away from his disciples. What was he doing? There's one time in the scripture where he was gone. He, 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 and it probably happened more than once. He prayed all night. What was he doing? He was accessing heaven. He was spending time with Father. And so we have the same privilege of doing that today. So Christ is enthroned. Where is Jesus right now? He's enthroned in the heavenly places. He is praying and interceding on our behalf. And he wants us to come up and chat with him. He wants us to come up and spend time with him. I know this sounds, some of you, this may sound like this is something that's supposed to happen in the future. Yes, it is, but it's also to happen right now. Because our future has everything to do with how we live now. And and so and so by doing this, by by getting our focus and our attention on taking, I'm going to say it this way, of taking a journey into the heavenly realms. We are, when we do that, we are actually getting our, we are, we are cutting off the distractions of this life. If we only focus on the distractions of this life, we will become very weak Christians. We may, we may even be carnal Christians. We must spend time with, our, with, with Jesus in the heavenly realm so we can receive direction from him and, be, and so he can have his input into our lives. All right. Um, so what are we to do? Well, to access heaven, I've already touched upon it in the Old Testament about the gate. We are to build a gate. The Old Testament verifies this. We are to build a gate and enter into the heavenly realm. We, and again, it's there where we receive, we receive assistance from the Lord. We receive help from the Lord. So we are actually one who is bringing heaven to earth. Now, how, you might say, well, how is this possible? It's possible because, because Jesus has paid a price for us, and this price he paid for us was so dear, but it was paid so that we could go to the heavenly courts and spend time with him there. Now, what I want to be careful, what I want to, I want to um, ex uh, express to you very much, and that is what I'm sharing with you is not something that you're to take and make a new teaching out of, to put a different slant on it, to, put, to, put a, to try to put a handle on it and say, and take this to the Christian market. I'm, I'm presenting this, these te this teaching to you so you who's listening to this will learn how to, take, to make access to the heavenly places. So you will find your way. As you, 
As you make your place to the heavenly courts, it becomes more familiar and more familiar. And it's where you'll become so accustomed to it that you can actually, in your mind, you can turn your attention away from what you're, you may be at work and you may be thinking about things at work. And I certainly, I certainly understand that we have to be paying attention at work, but you can take a moment and turn your thoughts to the things of God. And all of a sudden you can start to be caught up in the heavenly places. It can happen that easily, that quickly, if, you, if we discipline ourselves to do, to do that. And this is how we receive things from God. Now, the question I have now is, does, do, we, do we see community expressed in the Old Covenant? So now I'm going to switch back to the Old Covenant. And, and I, want, I, want us to, I want us to pay attention. Do we see community expressed in the Old Covenant? Because if we do then by all means, community is to be in the new covenant, but probably in a different way. All right, so I'm going to read to you several verses here. And this is in Exodus 19. And I'm going to be reading verses 1, and then I'm going to jump over to verse 16 through 22. All right, it says, and it says here, it says exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai on the morning of the third day. Uh, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from the ram horn, ram's horn and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain and all of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke bellowed in, into the sky like smoke from a, a brick kiln. And the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his, his reply. The Lord came down on the top of the mountain, Mount Sinai, and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed to the mount, top of the mountain. Then the Lord told Moses, Go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to, to see the Lord, or they will die. Now I'm stopping in the middle of this. I want to make, just make a note, a note here because God was telling Moses to go back and tell them to don't break forth in it and unto, the, unto his presence. Because if they, if they don't approach me correctly, they, they're coming into my holy presence, they're going to end up dying. Because the bound, boundaries had been set up and they had to, they had to watch how they approach God. Because, because here you have humanity, humanity approaching a God who's holy, who would come down on earth, on this mountain, and the mountain is trembling. Please see the scene that's going on here. The mountain is trembling. There's lightning and there's bolts of thunder going out all over this thing. And there's a dark cloud that came down on this mountain and the people see it. So Moses goes up first and then Moses comes down from the direction of God and says, tell them, please don't rush up here. Okay, now I'm going to pick up again. Even the priest who, who regularly come near to the Lord must purify themselves that the Lord does not break out and destroy them. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke bellowing from the mountain, they, stay, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will, we will listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you, and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. Now, I believe when God had Moses go back and tell the people about the boundaries, this was God's, we see, we, we begin to see the heart of our father. The father wanted the people to come to him. We know when you look in the scripture, it had been 400 years since God has spent any time with his people. He was, he, was, he was anxious to meet with his people. He desired to meet with his people, but he wanted to make sure that they approached him the correct way and they didn't do something they shouldn't because they would die. He didn't want them to die, but he wanted to make sure they all got up into his presence so he could spend time with them. Now, the reaction from the people is so interesting because they see all this happening around them and they think, this, I can't do this. They become fearful they're, and they're, their knees started shaking and they talked to Moses, says, we're not going up there. You go talk to him, but we're not going to talk to him because if we talk to him, we will surely die. You tell us what God is saying. Come back and tell us, but we're not going to go up there. They were scared. And so, and so as a result, 
they, they didn't go up. But what's interesting about all this, Moses did go up. Well, now, my question to that is, why did Moses go up? Well, the reason Moses went up is because Moses had already encountered God. He had already, on his, by himself, he saw the same thing they did. He saw the, he saw the, the, the lightning and the thunder, and he heard the, the, lamb's, the lamb's horn really loud. And he saw this dark cloud coming on the mountain. He felt the shaking of the mountain under his feet. He experienced everything they did. But Moses tried to get them to come up, but they wouldn't do it. So what did Moses do? He went right up into the presence of God. Why? Because he had encountered God before, before this. And he knew that there's, there's all of this going on, but he knew behind all that was God's presence. And so he decided, he, he, if they, he tried to get them to come, they wouldn't. He just went on without them. And he spent time with God. And, and uh, so Moses was accustomed to not spending, not seeing God at a distance, he was, a, he was a man who had learned to appreciate God close up, as Adam and Eve did back in the garden. Remember how we started this, Adam and Eve in the garden. They, they knew God close up. Now, so, if, so my question is, you know, if, if they had gone up into the mountain, there would have been amazing things happening. Now, if that's in the Old Testament, what can we expect today in the New Testament? What should we as believers today expect today? And can we somehow find out about what should happen now? Now, what I want to do next is I want us to go into our future. What does the word say about our future concerning community, about God spending time with us? It talks about it. It's only, I, I just, it's, it's in the book of Revelation. I want to start reading, and I'm going to read three places in Revelation. I'm not going to be able to get through all three places today. I'm just going to be able to get through one, and I may be able to talk about it briefly, and then I'll pick up with the third part on the rest of it. But I want to start in Revelations uh, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Then in a vision I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and earth had passed away, and, I, and, and the sea no longer existed. I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem descending out of the heavenly realm from the presence of God like a pleasing bride that had been prepared for her husband, adorned for her wedding. And I heard a thunderous voice from the throne saying, Look, God's tabernacle is with human beings, and from now on, he will tabernacle with them as their God. Now God himself will have his home with them. God with them will be their God. He will wipe away every, every tear from their eyes and eliminate death entirely. No one will mourn or weep for any longer. The pain of wounds will no longer exist for the old order has ceased. And God enthroned spoke to me and said, Consider this, I am making everything to be new and fresh. Write down at once all that I have told you, because each word is trustworthy and dependable. Then he said to me, It has been accomplished, for I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water to all who are thirsty. As my gracious gift, they will continuously drink from the fountain of the living water. The conquering ones will inherit these gifts from me. I will continue to be their God, and they will continue to be my children for me. All right, so I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to pick up on the next lesson. I'm not going to reread what I just read, uh, I don't think, but I'll, exp I'll, exp I'll start explaining about what I just read. Thank you very much.